speaks for itself. And we pray as the word of God goes forward, it will accomplish that which you set it up to do. I pray that these words that are coming out will, will be chain-breaking words. I pray that these will life, be life-giving words, and these will be homecoming words. And these will be words of hope and forgiveness to those who have no hope and who feel like no one loves them. So Lord, bring your word and let it change people's lives today in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. So Amos is in the Old Testament. Amos chapter 5. I'm just going to read a couple of scriptures there. Then I'm going to jump over to Hosea. These are just the scriptures the Holy Spirit put on my heart. And I'm sure somehow he'll put it together. Some of the greatest messages I think that people think that this message has ever preached are the ones I have no idea where they're going. And I'm thinking to myself, well, I don't know. <laughs> Anybody got anything out of that? People come up crying, oh, Pastor, you know that. Okay. And then you know it's all God. Because I don't have the mind for it. It's God's word. We just want to surrender ourselves and say, Lord, I don't know their hearts. I did not die for them. You died for them, so you give me what to speak. How in the world could I think I know? Uh, Amos chapter 5, verse 1. Hear this word which I take up against you. A lamentation, O house of Israel. And I kind of take it, O house of America. The virgin of Israel has fallen. She will rise no more. She lies forsaken on her land. And there is no one to raise her up. For thus saith the Lord, The city that goes out by a thousand shall have only a hundred left. And that which goes up by a hundred shall have ten left to the house of Israel. For thus saith the Lord of the house of Israel, Seek me and live. Seek me and live. Do not seek Bethel, nor into Gilgal, nor pass over to Beersheba. For Gilgal shall surely go into captivity, and Bethel shall come to nothing. Seek the Lord and live. Lest he break out like a fire in the house of Joseph and devour it. God, I'm afraid, if America does not really repent is going to break out like fire on America. We think sometimes that our enemies are those radical left-wing people that are going for socialism. I mean, we don't need socialism, my friends. Well, let me give you a history lesson. But it's not going to be that. It's going to be God saying, you know what? I founded this nation for you. And you threw me out of school. I gave you my word. And you decided it was no longer good for your children? God is angry with America, I can tell you that. I'm just praying for his mercy. Because depending on what happens this November 3rd, this country will not be the same. A couple things you need to see. He says here, uh, to things to prepare for. And I think we all need to do this, to prepare. He said, Pre prepare, verse, I'm going to go up to 12, 412, he says, Thus saith the Lord, because I will do this to you, prepare to meet your God. So there's some things that we need to prepare ourselves for. We need to prepare to meet God. Every one of you guys, in a moment's notice, in one heartbeat, you may be standing before the Lord. Are you ready? Are you ready to stand before the Lord? You know, I have two friends, dear friends, both of them beautifully saved, and I'm thankful. One of them was talking to a guy when we worked at the at Woodhouse. He was talking to a, one of the people that worked for him on the telephone, and the next thing he knew, there, there was a noise, and he died. He just had a massive heart attack. Chris, Bristol. And he was, he was young, and he was thin. He was in good shape. His time had come. The last thing Chris ever said to me is, I love you, brother. I'll never forget that. And Michael D. Young. Michael Young. What a good brother he was. Same thing. He was a hunter like Steve. Always going hunting. One morning he, he didn't wake up for hunting. And he was hunting on the other side. But Michael loved the Lord. But he had no idea this was coming. None of us really know the day. You know when you're born, you have an expiration date. Somebody brought me a Mountain Dew out of our pop machine the other day. Said, this tastes like water. Well, no kidding. It was from April. It had an expiration date. And so, I don't stop it, just so you know. Uh, but we are all born with an expiration date, and so we need to live our lives because we don't know that date. And of that hour, only God knows. And some of us live like we got all the time in the world, and I'm telling you, when the time comes, it's over. 
and not an earthly pride where you think you think you, you your stuff don't stink. I mean proud because that's my boy. That's my daughter. She loves me. She honors me. She lives for me. She chooses to do right even when it's easier to do wrong. That's what God wants. So we need to prepare to meet God. Prepare yourselves. We need to prepare the way of the Lord. John the Baptist came, comes from Isaiah, saying, prepare you the way of the Lord. Prepare your heart. Make your path straight. John the Baptist came to say, because between John the Baptist and, and Malachi, there was 400 years nobody heard from God. There was not a prophetic word heard for 400 years in the land of Israel. And now suddenly here comes John the Baptist, who was prophesied from Isaiah, the one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. And I'm telling you guys, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Yeah. Jesus is coming. Yeah. You know what, Jesus, you'll always find that God comes in the darkest of hours. Yeah. And you know one thing, another thing about 400 years is the children of Israel were in Egypt, in bondage for 400 years. And you know what happened during that 400 years? They were killing all the male children because the Egyptians were afraid because Israel was becoming bigger than them. And they thought, we need to enslave them. And they were killing all the male children so they couldn't make any more males. Mass babies were being murdered. And then came Moses, the deliverer. Then jump ahead to a little town of Bethlehem. After 400 years without a voice until John the Baptist came on the scene. And John the Baptist didn't come yet. Jesus came. Uh, John was born, but he wasn't proclaiming things. But Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And do you know what happened when Jesus was born in Bethlehem? When King Herod had heard that Israel's king was born, there was mass killings of babies. And you know what happens in America? To the tune of the millions? You know, the Bible says in, that uh, in Lamentations and Jeremiah that Rachel weeping for her children. Can you imagine what it would be like to have no more sounds of babies? No more crying. I mean, I love the babies cry. I think babies are awesome to me. But the same thing happens. So we had the, the mass killing of the babies before the deliverer. We have a mass killing of the babies before the master, before the Messiah. Now we've got mass killing of the babies that made the other mass killings of the babies look like very little. Of course, one life is terrible. We've killed millions. We've aborted millions of babies. They will say to you that it's endangered. You can't kill a certain kind of turtle, and if you do, you'll go to jail, but yet you can kill a child and a woman. America has sinned against the Lord. We need to prepare you the way of the Lord. There's a man who posted something. I posted something on Facebook, and, and he, he, he has a different political view, but he's supposed to be a Christian. Well, he said something political to me, and I said, well, brother, you have a, a right to your opinion. I said, but I'll tell you this. I draw the line on abortion. I will never, can never, wouldn't think of ever endorsing, voting for anyone who is pro-abortion. I don't care what you say. It's wrong. Now, I don't like any of these politicians, not a one, I really don't. You have to find somehow, you need to prayerfully figure out a vote. Vote for whoever's platform more resembles what God would want you to vote for. Because remember something. Is that for me? Hello? Is it God? Okay. You need to prepare your heart. We need to prepare our hearts. We need to prepare ourselves to be without fault. We need to prepare to be merciful and truthful. Just as God has been merciful to us and true to us, you need to be merciful to others. Some of us, you forget where you come from. That's why Jesus said, why do you try to take the splinter out of your neighbor's eye when you got a log in your own eye? Remember the story of the man who, David, when he went and took Uriah the Hittite's wife, he had, I don't know how many hundreds of wives and concubines. David has this woman, and then she sends word that she's pregnant. 
So rather than manning up, David fixes it so Uriah the Hittite is going to be killed. So now suddenly he can say, well, that's my child. He wanted to cover up the lie. So God sent Nathan the prophet, and he gave David a little story. He said there was a man who had only one sheep, and there was another man who had hundreds of sheep, and somebody came to his house, and he's talking to the King David. King David doesn't know he's busted. Somebody came to his house for a feast, and, and this man took the man's one sheep when he had hundreds and slaughtered it to serve this man. What shall we do, he said. David said, he needs to die. You would read the past judgment. And then the, Nathan the prophet said, that man is you. So sometimes it's easy for us to pass judgment on others and forget what God has forgiven you from. Don't ever forget where you came from. We need to prepare for the work of the Lord. We've got work to do and we need to prepare for the work. Now I want to jump up here to Hosea chapter 10. Hosea. The Lord's Spirit is moving here. I feel him. Ooh. I can find it. I might have dropped it. Oh, Hosea. This is a this is a powerful scripture. Of course, the whole the whole Bible is awesome. Thank you. Always one. Thank you, brother. Okay, listen to this word here. Hosea chapter ten, verse twelve, and this is a word speaking to these people. And I've quoted this to you before, but I want you to really hear this. I want you to hear this as God saying this to you, every one of you, not to us, as, as a multi, but first I want you to see it as God saying to you, brother, sister, listen, sow to yourself in righteousness, reap in mercy, bring up your fallow ground for it is time to seek the Lord until he comes and rains righteousness upon you. You have plowed wickedness and you have reaped iniquity. You have eaten the fruit of lies because you trusted in your own way in the multitude of mighty men. Therefore, tumult shall arise among your people and all your fortresses shall be plundered. So, sow yourself in righteousness, reap in mercy, for it is time to seek the Lord. When I first got saved, the man who led me to the Lord, the vessel that God used his name is Bill Crum. He's a dear, dear man of God. And to this day, I don't know that I know another person who knows the word like he does. He gave me an old Holman Bible of his. And I remember when I opened it up, right at the top of the first page, he had written with his hand, Seek the Lord, and highlighted it. That was like one of the first things I saw. That statement has become my battle cry. That statement has become my heart song. If you know, like Jim, we go back 20-some years we've been reading the Bible together. How many times have I taught on seeking the Lord, seeking the Lord, seeking the Lord, because this is what God's called us to do. So first we've got to we've got to break up our fallow ground. Some of us in this room, we have fallow ground. Fallow ground is ground that was once good for something. It once produced a crop. But oftentimes the farmer will say, I'm going to let the line, I'm going to let this ground go for, or dormant just for a year or two. Let it kind of get back the minerals and everything, and then I'll turn it up again. Some of us used to be used by God in a greater way, but then we'll let it go fallow, but we never really did turn it up again. That's when we need revival. To me, this is a revival prayer. Break up the fallow ground of your heart. For it's time to seek the Lord until he comes and rains righteousness upon you. Is God raining righteousness on, on you today? Are you walking in the storm of God's righteousness, in the glory of his righteousness? Years back I had a dream that I and Reinhard Bunke, of all people, this is, this is how the dream was. We were walking in a neighborhood that I used to live in when, when I was a kid, and we were both pushing our lawnmowers. Me and Reinhard Bunke, you know who he was? He preached up. Millions of people, men of God. And I tell you, that hard German accent. And I stopped and I said, Reinhardt. Like I call him Reinhardt. And this guy was something. I said, brother, 
I said, I, would you please pray for me? And we stopped pushing our lawnmowers, and Reinhardt puts his hand on me and begins to pray. And in this dream, I felt like a feather floating down to the earth. And when I hit the earth without any thud, I began to feel warm drops of oil hitting my face one drop at a time. Like, the, like when the rain first starts to come. Just warm oil, Holy Ghost oil, just touching my face and beginning to cover me. And I laid there for I don't know how long in the dream, and then I wake up, my heart's gone. So I grabbed my, motor, my, my uh, lawnmower and I started looking for Reinhardt because I want to mow lawns with Reinhardt Bucky. I think God was saying, I want you to be in the same field. I want you to, I want you to go out and, and reach people with the gospel. Even though you're not Reinhardt Bunky, you don't have to be Reinhardt Bunky. You can be Bob. You can be Chick. You can be Rick. You can just be you, but do it to the best of your ability and allow God to use you any way he sees fit. Remember when the, the guy... When the king gave talents, he gave one, five talents, one, two, and another one. And the moment the five went, and he produced another five, and when he came back, he said, I knew you were harsh, and you're a businessman, so here's the five you gave me, here's five more. And he said, well done, good and faithful servant. Then the one who had two, he came and says, I knew you were strict businessman, so I took what you gave me, I invested it, here's the two you gave me, and here's two more with interest. And he said, well done, good and faithful servant. He said the same thing to the one who had two as the one who had five, because he knew that's, that's what he could handle. God knows what you got. He equips you. So, take what you got and use it for the glory of God. And then the one, though, the one said, I don't know, this guy scares me. I'm just going to bury it. I don't want to lose it. So when he came back, he said, what have you got? Well, he said, well, I knew you were a harsh businessman and shrewd, so here's the talent you gave me. I hid it in the field. I didn't invest it. He said, you wicked, wicked man. Take from him, throw him in prison. Take the, the one that he had, give it to the one who has ten. So God is just saying, we're not all Reinhardt Bunkies. We're not all Billy Grahams. We might just be some ordinary guy in Omaha, Nebraska, or any other place who's preaching the gospel, I just want to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. Listen, amen? amen? Not everybody who gets to heaven is going to hear that. Not everybody who gets to heaven. You'll be saved because of God's grace and mercy. But you did nothing with the talent that he gave you. With the gifts of the Spirit that he gave you. All of us have gifts. You're born with many gifts. And we're not operating them. So, seeking the Lord. Here's how you have to seek the Lord as, as followers of Jesus. You have to seek God with all your heart, it says in Deuteronomy chapter 4, 29. He said, if you seek me with all your heart, you will find me. In other words, on the other hand is, if you don't seek me with all your heart, you're not going to find me. If you just half-heartedly seeking God, you're not going to find him. Because God is only going to be found for that one who's looking for him. The Bible says, the eyes of the Lord search to and fro all over the earth looking for someone who loves him. Does he see you today? Or is his eyes passing over you? Just because you know who he is doesn't mean you love him, right? Anybody know who Michael Jordan is? <laughs> Greatest basketball player of all time. Doesn't mean you know him. You don't have his phone number. It sure don't mean you love him. So to know who he is is not, it's not good enough. You've got to know him intimately. You need to seek him continually, continually. You don't stop seeking him. It's a daily search. It's a daily quest. I want to know Jesus. When Paul the Apostle was near his death, his time was coming short. Paul made the statement, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. Now, if Paul the Apostle, who was a, a tremendous man of God, if he was saying at the end of his life, I want to know Christ, who did know him? What Paul was saying is, there's a death that you can know him. And you'll never get to the bottom of it because God's ways are unsearchable. But that doesn't mean don't search. The more you seek after the Lord, the more you find him. That's why some people seem to walk with more anointing or more understanding than others because they seek him. Any treasure worth finding, you've got to dig for it. And what you do is you turn the world off. Turn the television off. Take your phone out of your pocket. Get on your face before the Lord and read his word. 
You know, the sad thing is, is when, when we get to heaven, some of us are going to see the opportunities we missed to share the gospel with people. I, I would quite sure that there are somebody that I missed, many that I missed, opportunities I didn't take that I should have. I try not to let that happen, but I'm sure it has. But sometimes we go through the day we don't even know anybody's around us because we're so self-absorbed. Jesus is not selfish. There's not a selfish bone in his body. We seek the Lord by prayer. We seek the Lord by turning from sin. We seek the Lord by preparing our heart to be with him. We seek the Lord diligently. I like that. Diligently. The, the scripture says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. He says... But without faith it's impossible to please him for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek after him. Not just seek after him, but diligent. You see the difference in the, ad in, in the adverb? Is that what it is, the adverb? You know, I like in the King James where it says ETA, he that hungereth, he that cometh to me, he that seeketh me. Whenever you see that ETH in the King James, he's not saying just come once. He that cometh means he continues to come and comes and come. And he that seeks me, he doesn't seek me once, but he continues to seek me. He seeketh me. That's what God wants. And if you're going to be that vessel that God is going to use, you've got to seek him. And here's the ten blessings of seeking the Lord, and I'll leave you alone. Right now as I'm speaking, the Holy Spirit is moving on some hearts. And God is ready to open your eyes. To a life you've never even seen before. Some of you folks have been raised in the church all your life, but you've never had an encounter with Jesus. You heard mom shouting about Jesus. You heard pastor shouting about Jesus. You heard sis shouting about Jesus, but you've never had an encounter with Jesus yourself. And once you have that encounter with Jesus, you'll be shouting. You'll be praising because you realize what he saved you from. When you seek the Lord, he will be found. If you seek the Lord with all your heart, He will be found. God's not playing hide and seek, and He's not playing hard to get. We just don't have a desire for Him. Ask God, God, give me a desire for you. God, give me a desire for the things of God. The Bible says, put your eyes on the things above, not on the things below. Why do we put our eyes on all this crap down here? We want all these things the world has. I know a guy right now who's got combined probably two million dollars of cars in his garage. Mm. But he has no peace in his heart. Mm. And I can't tell you today if this was his last day that he would be crossing over the Jordan to stand before the Lord. Remember, the more you have in this world, the more you think someone's trying to steal it from you. Nobody can take what God gives you. If you seek the Lord, he will hear and he will answer your prayer. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then, and only then, will I hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and heal their land. God is speaking this to you. He's speaking it to all of us. If my people are called by my name, what name? Yahshua, Jesus, Yahweh, will humble themselves and pray. When you, when you seek the Lord, you will not lack any good thing, it says in Psalms chapter 34. Those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. Hallelujah. And what God says is good and what we think is good are two different things. But I can promise you, the Bible says, I have not yet seen the righteous begging bread. So when you seek the Lord, now there's been church people who have had some difficult times, of course. But I'm talking about someone who seeks the Lord, who pursues the Lord. And as I always picture in my mind, that cat stalking its prey. That's how God wants you to focus on him. And then a cat, man, if an animal moves, I mean, so focused. I want that kind of focus from God. If you seek the Lord with all your heart, you'll find life, it tells us in Psalm 69. If you seek the Lord with all your heart, it says here in, Psalm, in, in Hosea, 
that God is going to rain righteousness upon you. So you see, man, I'm struggling. I'm struggling with my life. I keep singing. Paul said, there are things that I do that I hate, things I want to do I don't do. But when you seek after the Lord, God is going to pour righteousness, rightness, God rightness into your life. I've met people before who I knew they were Christians before they said they were a Christian. They didn't have a cross on. They didn't have a Jesus shirt on. I just knew. I knew that aroma. The rightness of God was upon that person. That's what God wants out of all of us. And that comes by seeking the Lord. When you seek the Lord, the Bible says God will pour His glory upon you. Not that you're going to steal His glory, but His glory, His presence. Glory. His Shekinah glory. It's here in this room. If you had eyes to see, you'd see it. David Mendoza had a vision. Uh, David has a lot of visions. He shared with me one here today. God is getting ready to do things in such a mighty, in a mighty way. And there is a place coming, a bigger place coming. I know that. But our job is not to go out and look for a big place. My job is just to look to Jesus. The author and the finisher of our faith. Keep my eyes on him. My job, my, the base, the only thing I can really do for you folks, as I said last week, is to, to, to give you a hunger for God. I hope that my hunger, when I have it, makes you hungry. You ever sit with anybody who's eating some good buttered popcorn and they won't share it? <laughs> or you go to the movie theater and you say, hey, you want some popcorn? I don't want popcorn. And then you're watching the movie and all of a sudden these little hands start, hey. That's happened more than once. I want to make you hungry for God. Yeah. I want you to be hungry and thirsty for God. And then when you seek the Lord with all your heart, you will have honor. You think of a man like Billy Graham. I don't care if you're if you're a Christian or an atheist or a Muslim. People honor Billy Graham because he walked with God and he didn't compromise. <coughs> I remember after 9-11, they had that service in the National Cathedral, and they had people from different faiths go up there, and they had their part. And then old Billy Graham went up there. White hair flowing. He would just look like Moses to me. I just thought, oh my goodness, what a man of God. God let him live for 100 years, 99 years. He was honored. He, he received honor. When you seek the Lord, you will have immortality. You will have eternal life. When you seek the Lord, you're never going to die. And here's the bad thing. If you don't seek the Lord, you're never going to die either. But you will be eternally <coughs> separated from God. And you will know that separation and you will know that torment. The Bible clearly describes hell. It's a real place. Heaven's for real and so is hell. You don't want to go there. And if you seek the Lord... You will find rewards. Now I'm not in it for the rewards. I'm just blessed that he knows who I am. I'm just blessed that my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. If I could get hold of that book, I would find Steve Sheridan's name in that book. How awesome. Is your name written in the Book of Life? Praise the Lord. If it's not, it can be today. But here's what happens if you don't seek the Lord. If you sow wickedness, you're going to reap wickedness. If you sow sin, you're going to reap sin. If you sow hate, you're going to reap hate. If you're going to sow immorality, you're going to reap immorality. Some people will eat fruit, the fruit of lies. When you're a liar, people are going to lie to you. Sometimes people say, I don't understand why things aren't going right for me. Well, I think you're probably just reaping a lot of what you've sown. But the awesome thing is if you would come to the Lord today and ask God to change your heart and ask Him to take your life and make it His. From this point on and leave it behind. <clears throat> would I give a gift to somebody? Here, chick. Once I give it to her, it's no longer mine to take back. But what we do is we say, okay, Lord, here's my heart. And the service is over and you're crying and then you come back, hey, Lord, you got that heart again? 
I'm not quite done with that old heart. Man, you don't know what life is until it gives you a new heart. When you wake up and you realize you don't hate on people and you love people and you cry over things you never cried about and your heart aches over people who are broken. If you don't ache over the thought of people going to hell, I need to know. You need to see if you've got that new heart or not. How do we sleep at night knowing that people are going to hell? Seriously. People we know are going to go to hell forever and ever and ever without end. That's got to change. So I say to you today, sow to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, because it is time to seek the Lord until He comes and rains righteousness upon us. It is time for us to say no to the old ways. No to the old life. Don't get so caught up in the politics of this world. Get caught up in the the one who created everything. You know, when we were kids, we'd all say, you know what? My dad could whip your dad. <laughs> oh, no, he can't. My dad could whip your dad. My dad could whip everybody. But that's instant. But my father, he could whip anybody. He could whip addiction. He can whip immorality. He can whip pornography. He can he can whip whip cancer. He can whip anything. And so I'm saying to you today, if you will come today and say, you know what? He's right. It's time. Today's the day. Picture Jesus in heaven right now with a pen in his hand. The book is open. And he's dipping the ink in his precious blood. And he's just waiting to write somebody's name in there. Does he know how to spell your name? Are you going to come and out and say, Lord, put me in your book. I'm sorry for the life I've lived. I have broke your heart. I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son, but today, please forgive me of my sins. Here's the truth of the matter. Folks, if you give your life to Jesus because he's worthy, and we all busted hell wide open. It wouldn't be right. It would be just. Because we deserve hell. But mercy says, I forgive you. I love you. And come on. If God's moving on your heart and you want to see your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life, I'm saying, make a choice today. Say, I want Jesus. I'm tired of living the life that I used to live. And some of you guys, God's stirring your heart. You know he's talking to you, but you don't want anybody to see he's talking to you. Forget all that nonsense. You know why we men don't cry? Men don't cry because we're wicked. Men don't cry because we have pride. We don't want to see we're not a tough guy. We, we cry when we're little boys. And we cry when we're men. If you're a real man. So I'm saying to you today, if you want to give your life to Jesus, if you want to see Jesus write your name in the Lamb's Book of Life, I would like you to come forward here and let me pray for you today.